Welcome to the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church Sunday School Lesson for Sunday, September 25th, 2022. I am Rev. Mary Tillman, an Associate Minister at the Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church, and I will be the presenter of today's lesson. We are now in our fall quarter study, and our theme for this quarter is God's Exceptional Choice. Unit 1 the theme is God Calls Abraham's Family. And today's lesson is the fourth lesson, which is the last one in Unit 1. Our lesson title in the Townsend Press Sunday School Commentary is The Scepter is Given to Judah. And in the Faith Pathway Bible Studies for Adults, the lesson title is Dynamics of Family Leadership. Dynamics of of family leadership. Our devotional reading comes from the book of Numbers, chapter 24, verses 2 through 9, and verses 15 and set through 17. The background scripture, Genesis chapter 35, verses 22b through 26, chapter 38, verses 12 through 19, and verses 24 through 26, and chapter 49, verses 8 through 12. The printed passage, Genesis 35, 22b through 26, chapter 38, verses 24 through 26, and chapter 49, verses 10 through 12. Our key verse, Genesis 49, verse number 10. From the NIV Bible, it reads, The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nations shall be his. Let us pray. Father God, thank you so much for the opportunity to study your holy word. Please open our minds that we may learn and understand the benefit of living a godly life, a life that is pleasing to you. Thank you for choosing us, for choosing me, in spite of my shortcomings, faults, and failures. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's look at the lesson introduction. The, the lessons of this quarter traces the arc of salvation from Abraham to Jesus and on to the early church. This is the last lesson in Unit 1 entitled, God Calls Abraham's Family. The four lessons of Unit 1 are from the book of Genesis. This week's lesson offers yet another example of God choosing apart from cultural norms when Judah, Jacob's fourth son, was called to head the family from which the Messiah would one day be born. In this lesson, we see family dysfunction on full display in the very family that God called to be his chosen people. So get your Sunday school book, your Bible, your pen and a notepad, and follow along as we go forward with this wonderful lesson I think we'll see ourselves in this lesson. Let's get started. Again, the title of our lesson today is Dynamics of Family Leadership. There are three questions to consider. The first question, what disqualified Reuben, Jacob's firstborn, from receiving the inheritance? Question number two, what does this lesson teach us about sin, repentance, and blessings? And question number three, what did Tamar do when she discovered that Judah failed to follow through with her marriage to his youngest son? Looking at the lesson's biblical context, this week we are visiting in full display the actions of a dysfunctional family of great significance. Today's lesson follows Jacob's wrestling with God as he anticipated meeting his brother Esau after fleeing from him 20 years earlier. During that struggle, Jacob prevailed and received a new name, symbolic of a change in his character and confirmation as heir of the Abrahamic covenant. However, 
In Genesis 33, Jacob failed a test of faith. Instead of trusting God's promise to protect him, he resorted to scheming to appease his estranged brother when he saw him and his 400 men. During and after their reunion, Jacob succumbs to his old nature and allows it to dictate his behavior. But eventually, Jacob did show remorse for taking advantage of his brother Esau. As we read in Genesis chapter 33, verse 17, and chapter through chapter 34, verse 31, Jacob displayed the command to return to Bethel and cause another crisis by deciding to dwell in Succoth near Shechem. He exposed his family to the idolatrous practices of the Canaanites living there. As a result, his daughter is raped and two of his sons commit premeditated murder in an act of vengeance. The sons' sins tainted Jacob's witness before the inhabitants and placed his family in grave physical danger. Only through God's faithfulness to his promise of protection did Jacob and his family finally get to Bethel safely. Yet, additional heartache awaited him there because of emerging dysfunctional behaviors among his 12 sons. Genesis chapter 35, verses 22 through 26, chapter 38, verses 24 through 26, and chapter 49, verses 10 through 12. This week's lesson text provides a panoramic view of the later days of Jacob's life and the saga surrounding his family. We are again introduced to the sons of Jacob, and we are provided the names of their mothers. The second biblical text in this lesson takes place three months after Judah, who was Jacob's fourth son, had engaged in illicit sexual relations with his daughter-in-law, who was found to be pregnant. The final passage, Genesis 49, verses 10 through 12, covers the period when Jacob blessed his fourth-born son Judah, giving him the leadership position of the family. The prominent people in this week's lesson are Jacob, Judah, and Tamar. Jacob was the son of Isaac and Rebekah. He was the father of the sons who became the family heads of the twelve tribes of Israel. Judah, the fourth son of Jacob, whose mother was named Leah, was the leader of the tribe of Judah. Tamar, the daughter-in-law of Judah, and the wife of two sons, Er and Onan, devised a plot and enticed Judah, her father-in-law, to have sex with her. She gave birth to twin boys, naming them Perez and Zerah. Jacob's sons were the cause of a great deal of family conflict and dysfunction. This week's lesson begins by examining the actions of two of Jacob's sons, Reuben and Judah. Let's look at the aims for this week's lesson. They are... Explain Jacob's complicated family dynamics that led to Judah's becoming the leader of his family. Next, sense the emotions in the story as those emotions that spark your own feelings. And the third one, seek wholeness and love amidst challenging family dynamics. There are three lesson outlines in the Adult Pathway Sunday School book. I will share two key points from each of these outlines and expound some on each of them. The first outline, forfeiting the birthright, Genesis chapter 35, verses 22b through verse 26. The second outline, the repentant heir apparent, that's Genesis chapter 38, verses 24 through 26. And our third and final outline, grace overrides dysfunction. Genesis chapter 49, verses 10 through 12. Let's begin our analysis of the biblical text for the first uh, lesson outline, forfeiting the birthright. Genesis chapter 35, verses 22b through verse 26. 
Key point number one, Reuben, Jacob's oldest son, loses his inheritance. Verse 22 reads, Jacob had 12 sons. Chap verse 23, the sons of Leah, Reuben, the firstborn of Jacob, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Ischar, and Zebulun. Verse 24, the sons of Rachel, Joseph and Benjamin. Verse 25, the son of Rachel's servant, Bilhah, Dan and Naphtali. 26, the sons of Leah's servant, Zilpah, Gad and Asher. These were the sons of Jacob who were born to him in Padan Aram. This is the list of Jacob's sons after he re-entered Canaan. It lays the foundation for the recognition of the 12 tribes of Israel as fulfillment of God's promise of a great nation to Abraham. Jacob's family's dysfunctional dynamics continued to bring ungodly attitudes and actions among them. Reuben, his firstborn son, engaged in a sexual relationship with Bilhah, one of Jacob's secondary wives. Reuben was in line to receive the birthright and assume family leadership because he was the firstborn. This incestuous sin disqualified him for this position. Reuben thought he got away with this action, but someone told his father what he had done. As the oldest son, Reuben stood to receive a double portion of the family inheritance. However, because of his disrespect toward his father, Reuben lost his inheritance. Key point number two. The promises of God are greater than the sins of men and women. Nothing in Jacob's past or in the lives of his children separated him from the promises of God that included many offspring and much land. Here, there is hope for every family that regardless of our sins, grace and hope are always present and active with God. Despite this unfortunate event, the hope of God's promise remained alive. God's covenant to bless Abraham and his seed was unconditional. This was an unconditional promise. Therefore, no matter what did or did not happen, God remained faithful to his promise. I want to stick a pen right here and say, we must remember that God's promises are definitely true and they will come to pass. It may not happen in our time frame that we would like for it to happen, but God is faithful to keep his promise. Hezekiah Walker sings a song, Faithful is our God, and truly we can say, Faithful he is, for every day he gives us brand new mercies that we don't deserve. But because of his grace and mercy, he remains faithful to his promise. Outline number two, the repentant heir apparent. Genesis chapter 38, verses 24 through 26. Verse 24 says, About three months later, Judah was told, Your daughter-in-law Tamar is guilty of prostitution, and as a result, she is now pregnant. Judah said, Bring her out and have her burned to death. Verse 25, As she was being brought out, she sent a message to her father-in-law. I am pregnant by the man who owns these, she said. And she added, See if you recognize whose seal and cord and staff these are. Verse 26. Judah recognized them and said, She is more righteous than I, since I wouldn't give her to my son Shelah, and he did not sleep with her again. The first 23 verses of this chapter, chapter 38, records the progressive stages of Judah's sin. He forsook the family and Jacob's godly influence, married a Canaanite woman, schemed and denied his firstborn's widow, Tamar, the right to a Leverite marriage. His first two sons who had married Tamar died, and Judah felt Tamar was somehow responsible for their deaths. Leverite marriage is a type of marriage in which the brother of a deceased man is obligated to marry his brother's widow. His first two sons died, resulting from God's judgment. During that time in that region, it was customary 
for a surviving brother to marry his brother's widow. Key point number one. Judah refused to give his daughter-in-law Tamar in marriage to Shelah, the youngest son, who was in line to marry her. Jacob never informed Tamar that Shelah was available for marriage. When Tamar realized what Judah had done, she removed her widow clothes and disguised herself as a Canaanite cult prostitute. She then slept with her unsuspecting father-in-law and demanded a pledge to ensure payment for their illicit encounter. Judah casually and unknowingly engaged in illicit sex with her, thinking she was a cult prostitute. Judah followed through on his payment agreement to his credit, but discovered that the woman he thought was a prostitute was unknown. Three months later, he received word that Tamar was pregnant, Unaware that she was the unidentified prostitute, Judah demanded her death for playing the harlot. Judah demonstrated a lack of spiritual insight by condoning his sin, but condemned Tamar after learning she was pregnant. As we just read in verse 24, about three months later, Judah was told that her his daughter-in-law, Tamar, was pregnant, and and he said, bring her out and have her burned to death. But as she was coming out, she sent a message to him. I'm pregnant by the man who owns these. She had his seal and cord and sent it to him and said, see if you recognize who these belong to. And Judah had to admit that they were his. And he recognized how more righteous she was than he was. And so he did not sleep with her again. So key point number two, Judah expresses sincere regret for what he did. Jacob admitted he had dealt with Tamar unjustly, and she bore no wrongdoing for what she did in response. Both Reuben and Judah had committed sexual sins, but Judah took responsibility for his sin. He owned up to what he had done because of his sincere regret for his wrongdoing. God used Judah to fulfill a prominent role in history. God still has the power to nullify any potential disqualification from a dysfunctional past for those who genuinely repent and humbly submit to his authority. Outline number three. Grace overrides dysfunction. Genesis chapter 49, verses 10 through 12. Chapter 49 is recognized as Jacob's final blessing of his sons before he died in Egypt. Key point number one. Jacob selected Judah to secure the family's future leadership. The first three sons, Reuben, Simeon, and Levi, disqualified themselves because of their presumptuous sins. Unlike his brothers before him, Judah repented of his immoral infidelity. Although Judah, his fourth-born son, sinned, Jacob's spiritual insight recognized him as qualified to head the royal tribe that he would generate in the future, take his name, and produce Israel's kings. Judah's sins of infidelity and hypocrisy did not cancel his place of future prominence and leadership. His selection was an act of grace. God's sufficient grace still provides hope for those who are damaged by dynamic dysfunctional family environments. Through all of Judah's family's dysfunctions, God selected him as the father of the royal family of Israel through whom the promised Messiah would come. Verse 10 says, The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he to whom it belongs shall come, and the obedience of the nation shall be his. The scepter denotes a symbol of authority or leadership. It is usually a staff or a rod. 
Jacob declared that from Judah would come a line of perpetual rulers who would exercise authority over his brothers, beginning with David, who was from the tribe of Judah. The verse literally states that the scepter shall not depart from Judah until the one arise for whom it was destined, the Messiah, the Messianic son of David. Key point number two. The greatest gift that Jacob prophesied to come through Judah as head of the royal family is the Messiah, Jesus Christ, as we read in verse 10. Verse 11 says, He will tether his donkey to a vine, his coat to the choicest branch. He will wash his garments in wine, his robes in the blood of the grapes. Verse 12, His eyes will be darker than wine, his teeth whiter than milk. Verses 11 and 12 are filled with figurative language that describes a time of great prosperity that will come to the sons of Israel. And it describes a period of great prosperity that the Messiah would bring Israel and the nations. Wine and milk were seen as symbols of wealth and prosperity. All these would be realized as the descendants of Abraham obeyed God. God's patience and long-suffering with his family proves that his grace overrides dysfunction and allows nothing to hinder his plans and purposes for those he chooses to join him in his mission of reconciling fallen humanity to himself. The famous O'Neill twins of St. Louis recorded a song a few years back that said, He chose me. He chose me. Out of all he could to choose, he cho- he chose me to do his work. I'm here to tell you, brothers and sisters, to be chosen by God, even in our frailties, in our faults, in our shortcomings, is good to know that he has a purpose for our lives. Be glad that God chose you. All we have to do is repent and turn from our wicked ways and truly want to live a life for him. A sincere repentance will open up rooms for many, many blessings and opportunities for God's precious promises are true and you are no accident, neither am I. We were designed for the time for which we lived to do the things that God has called us to do. In summary, today's lesson passage Several ungodly dysfunctional behaviors are identifiable among Abraham's descendants. These behaviors include lying, cheating, scheming, deception, sexual sins, murder, bigamy, and parental favoritism. Why would a holy God choose spiritual leaders from among such sinners and allow his son to be in their lineage? It was because of his grace, God's grace. Luther Barnes sing that song, God's grace. Now I'm not what I ought to be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. These men and women were far from being perfect and often sinned deliberately, just like us. Yet our omniscient God looked beyond what they were to what they would be because God's children are never victims of their circumstances. Let me say that again. God looked beyond what they were to what they would be because God's children are never victims of their circumstances. God still looks beyond faults, not overlooking them, sees needs and restores those who repent and come to him in faith. This lesson's inherent message is that God accepts those who genuinely repent and submit to his authority despite their past. And all of us have a past. We're all an X something or other. The promises of God are sure and humanity's failures do not thwart his faithfulness to them. Jacob looked forward to a time when the Lord would raise a new leader among the sons of Israel. He did not know what and who this unknown ruler would be that he saw coming out of the line of Judah. In the fullness of time, 
God sent forth his beloved son, Jesus Christ. In him, God brought the abundant life to all who believe. Jacob's pronouncement to Judah reminds us that God's future, although distant and maybe far off, will be a time of great rejoicing. What have you learned from this lesson about sin, repenting, blessings, and God's promises? I hope this lesson has blessed you as much as it has blessed me to remind us that despite our shortcomings, he chose me. Let us pray. Father God, thank you for this lesson. It has taught us to see that you look beyond our faults and see our potential. Thank you for seeing the best in us when everyone else could only see the worst in us. Because of your grace and mercy, we can truly say individually that God has smiled on me. Thank you, God, for choosing me. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Now have a wonderful day, a wonderful week, a wonderful month. God bless you.